It's time for the STL United Soccer Show, St. Louis's only all-soccer program. Welcome back. I'm Tom Schwarz, and I want to tell you that today's show is brought to you by Johnny Max, your home team store. Experience the home team advantage, www.johnnymax.com. Well, the voice of St. Louis soccer, Michael Mickler, is taking the ACT, but Vin Coe of St. Louis Pickup Soccer is here. Yeah. Vin? How are you doing, uh, Tom? Um, notice you got the Stoke City jersey on there. Stoke City, in <laughs> honor of, of my good friend, Dr. Welsh, who's in the hospital yet again. Get out of the hospital, Mike. Our guest today is a gentleman I've had the good fortune to become friends with over the past few years. I first heard of George Vesey of the New York Times many moons ago on Imus in the Morning. I learned that he wrote many books, one, The Coal Miner's Daughter, that became a big Hollywood hit, and that he loved the beautiful game, and that he's a great guy. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Mr. George Vesey. Hey, George. Good morning. Aren't, aren't you nice to remember the Imus introduction? You, you remember when he used to say that it was dog track time for, <laughs> for my, my children to leave me at the dog track? I <laughs> hope somebody would take me, uh, you know, put me away. Uh, those, those were the days when Imus was insulting me. <laughs> well, that's how you know you love it. He loves you, right? He was probably right. Yeah, well. I, I, actually, there were some people at the paper who began to think that. Yeah, well, uh, as evidenced by... Uh, your the, the thing I want to talk to you most about today is you you wrote an article on Giorgio Canalia. Tell uh, us about Giorgio, will you? Um, I only know that when I came back to sports in 1980, I'd been away for ten years, and I really knew nothing about soccer. The, the Cosmos were on their their way down um, fr- from the peak of the Pele years. He was already gone, and I went out there because I I knew I loved the game didn't know much about it, and went out there, and here was this hulking um, plotter, planner, schemer, manipulator, playing striker, or whatever, number nine, and and it was captivating to watch Canalia, because he wanted the ball, he was like a, you know, like a ball hog in basketball, or, a, you know, a Keyshawn Johnson saying, get me the damn ball, and, and he had that mentality on the field, just get me the ball and I'll do something with it. And, and many games he did. I mean, I was at one game early on, either 80 or 81, where he scored one way early in the game and then scored a different way using his weaker foot uh, to, to, to fool the goalie or to, or, and, and go around the defender a different way. He was just so compelling. And then when you realize that he had the ear of management, that he, yeah. was, he was the guy on that team who knew the owners and, and he would talk to them and if he wanted to get rid of a coach, he just got rid of a coach. Did did you get to meet him? Oh sure. You know the the soccer locker rooms were open in the uh, huh. in the NASL and uh, and now in MLS. It's not like overseas where you you only get to meet players on if you're lucky. You know at all you meet them in some kind of a mixed zone. Uh, players just don't talk to you in locker rooms. But in the in in the old league and now you can go in and talk to him. And he was this guy, and he wasn't shy. I mean, believe me, <laughs> I, I was I was glad to go up to him and say. You know, Giorgio, you know, what happened in the game today? And he would say, well, you know, the, my midfielders weren't getting me the ball, but I, I yelled long enough, and finally the coach told him what to, you know, he would, he would tell you this stuff. And his, the other players, I mean, Beckenbauer would be shaking his head, and Carlos <laughs> Alberto would be shaking his head. I mean, they had, they had a lot of strong personalities from, from the topest, the highest level of, of football in the world, and they would just be shaking their heads at this brash guy. I mean, I mean Giorgio had had the credentials. He was a World Cup player for Italy and had been a high scorer for Lazio. And and there he was in, in New Jersey just totally running the show. <laughs> Did you see the uh, uh, movie on the Cosmos once in a lifetime? You know, I want to say I didn't. I, I know people that are in it. I know, yeah. I know the story. I mean, the Cosmos live in imagination. They are yeah. like you know, I mean, in, in a way it's like the Brooklyn Dodgers are to, you know, to my generation in New York. Um, and 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 of course, somebody's got the the rights to the name Cosmo, right, and right, threatening yeah. to bring it back as a team in the in the MLS. But I don't think that's going to happen because, truthfully, if you brought back the name Cosmos, all it would be would be instant nostalgia. As much as I'm into in, instant <laughs> nostalgia, but you're not going to bring back Canadia, and yeah. you're not going to bring back Beckenbauer and Pele and Carlos Alberto. I mean, they're just not going to come back. 
So, so what's the point? You know, playing third rate guys, which right. the MLS has, and you know, I mean, knows it. You know, young players, old players. Um, you know, what's the point? You can call them the Cosmos, but they're just going to be a team playing in New York. Well, in the movie, Giorgio comes across as a total jerk, uh, totally self-absorbed. Which you know, maybe you have to be to be a, a striker. May, you know, this leads to my next question. How would you compare him with the uh, current uh, Italian bad boy, Super Mario Balotelli? Well, you know, it's different. I mean, uh, Giorgio had pretty much control of himself. He wasn't he wasn't kicking people, you know, breaking, uh, liking, liking to break their, their shins. I would say one thing, just to go back a little bit to the kind of persona that Giorgio was, is that I would take every talented boy and girl, uh, you know, I would because I'm subversive, I would take all of them and say, go, go, now that you've told me that, I would say, go watch this movie and be, you know, like, instead of be like Mike, be like Giorgio in the sense that you have to be feral. You have to want the yeah. ball. You have to be a miserable personality, to, to, particularly to be a striker. I mean, you can be a law and order person in midfield. You can be a, a nice guy and, and chip the ball out or, you know, well-behaved young woman and play defense and be a little bit tough. But if you want to be a striker, right. you know, get me the damn ball right. and... And and I would say that if there's one thing, watching the fiasco of the American Olympic team oh. getting knocked out, you know, not getting to the Olympics, watching these kids, I mean, and some of them are, far, are, are Mexican or, or, or German or whatever they are, but th- th- once they once they get into American soccer, they're too darn nice. They they uh, they're always waiting for a coach to tell them what to do, and that's my knock on on youth soccer is that. These kids quiver for that fraction of a second. Like, what does coach really want me to do? They haven't played street street soccer mm-hmm. and alley soccer the way Maradona did down in Buenos Aires. So, so they're not malicious personalities. Get me the ball, and I will score for my own glory, and you know, and for the rest of us too. Hey, George. There's anyway. The... Now you want to talk about Balotelli? No, He's no. Hey, George. Control. George, we got, hold, hold on. we got to go to break because I hear the oh, music. There you go. We'll be right back. You're listening to the STL United Soccer Show, KFNS, 590 The Fan, KFNS.com. We'll be right back with George Vesey. Three one four six four four six eight eight four. That's three one four six four four six eight eight four. Thank you, Doctor Dean. We're back on the soccer show with me, Tom Schwartz, Vin Co, and our special guest, George Vesey. George, you're going to tell us about Super Mario. Well, it's unfortunate. Here's someone with so much talent, and and bringing another another level or, or another dimension to Italian football. I mean, I mean, most of your listeners know he's adopted from Africa. He's, 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 he's black. And, you know, it would be a great look for the Italian team for opening it up and saying, you know, here's, here's, here's the new Italy and this and that. It's unfortunate that he also is just extremely immature, having nothing to do with his heritage. He's just immature. And other players have gone through that that they, they just don't know. And he's 21, and he's kicking people in the shins. I mean, that, that shot that he took at Alex Song yeah. of Arsenal right. the other day was just, just vicious. He wound up being suspended for, for three games because it was, a, it was his, I forget, third or fourth red card. And, uh, it, you know, it could have been, he could have been suspended into next season because that, that, that could have snapped the guy's leg. Yeah. How much of it do you think is, like, his his childhood growing up as a... African born child in Italy and um, and like his experiences within the Syria I mean um, he was constantly booed and then he moves over to the premiership and he's allowed more freedom and um, mm. I mean uh, it, it's, a, it's a fair question I honestly don't know I mean I followed it from afar um, certainly certainly that could 
he's always he's always stood out since the time he was you know adopted. I'm sure in a child. I mean, Italy Italy has uh, you know doesn't have a whole lot of interracial uh, adoptions that I know about. So so here he is coming along with an Italian name, and and people look, and you know what people and and goodness knows the the stuff that they hear from the stands all over Europe. All over is Europe, pretty nasty, yeah. and including including in England. But the premiership has has gotten past that to some degree. I mean, think of all the African players who've come right. in there oh, in yeah. the last the last decade since the premiership became the best league in in the world of uh, the number of African players. So I mean, it, it, it's a fair question, and I don't know. But at 21, he, he ought to get it together because he's squandering uh, so much talent. Yeah, he's he's an unbelievable player. Hey, I uh, we talked last week about talking about the uh, European Championships. Uh, could you tell me any any game? Give me a sense of what's going to be going on over there from your travels. Well, the thing about European football is that there are three things going on at the same time. Let's say particularly in the U.K., where you've got the FA Cup. I mean, you had a match this morning. Oh, my Lord. On Sunday. <laughs> Did you see and, this morning? And- no, I did not see it. Oh. I, I know that uh, oh. I know there was a header in the 87th minute by Carroll. A backwards header. By the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, it's it, and, but but at the same time you've got you've got Chelsea playing tomorrow, and there's the big question of whether Chelsea is going to hold back some of his players because it's also got a, um, Champions. a Champions League yeah. match in midweek. So so the question and, and that's the thing that makes. European football so great as opposed to our version of, of what we call American football you know the, 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 the helmet and cleats game is that <laughs> you can only afford to play once a week in football in American football because you got to rest all the concussions and you oh, can't yeah. have a quarterback going out there and you got to have game plans whereas with soccer you can play a couple of times a week and then the question is and you can have interchangeable players you can bring in a really talented striker who didn't run on on Saturday and ha- and have him run on Tuesday or Wednesday so you got all these different plots going on at this time of year plus in the in the premiership qualifying for um, the, the highest level next year getting in the top four the top six you know all, all that business so it's just so many plots at once now going into the the Champions League I have seen so many, I've actually never seen a game in person. I've never been able to get over there at that time of year. Mm-hmm. But to, to see games and going to some of the pubs that, down in the village to the long lamented oh, um, man. <laughs> the Longolo, which I miss so much. And, which, and hey, George, which is, which is the reason that we got to know each other, because you wrote, wrote a piece right. about that place, and I right. emailed you, and you emailed me back. Sorry. Well, I, I miss it. I miss it so badly. Um, <laughs> you know, my friend, my friend Pino had to pack up, and he, he moved back to uh, uh, the Castellamare, Sicily, uh, where he's got something going there. He's got he's got a, uh, an American pub going in, in Castellamare. If anybody's in the in there the you go. As, they, as they say, but which I hope to get to. But going down, particularly, nothing's ever replaced it. But I remember so many Champions League finals and semifinals, and being in there. I guess the one that I really remember. Is well, I mean, I saw I saw the famous comeback, the three nil to to three three comeback. But the one that I really remember was the final, in in which uh, the Bayern coach took out Mateus with with <laughs> right. the lead, yeah. right? And, and like the 80th minute, I can't remember the details, but he took out Mateus. And I remember that there were English guys in the place, <laughs> and there were German guys, <laughs> and and. Totally well behaved. I mean, there was not, you know, you know, they're not replaying World War Two, and they're not, you know, and 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 no hooliganism. I mean, these were these were grown ups who work in the city and live in the city, and they know you don't you don't bring that stuff over here. Right. But the German guys were groaning when the came <laughs> like, like, why why change the team? And they all speak English perfectly, yeah. and, they're, and they're groaning. And sure enough. Uh, man, you scored. I, I want to say once in regulation. Once yep. in, I, I, yeah. I don't. I don't remember the. Yeah, it was right at the death. That. Right yeah. at the death in, in of regulation, and then I think maybe right. in the first minute of added. Added. Yeah. Right. And didn't didn't their Swedish guy? What? Well, well, Norwegian. Ole guy, Gunnar well, Solskjaer. Right. 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 He scored. So anyway, it, 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 this all happened in like you know half an hour that it yeah. takes to finish that stuff. And <laughs> yeah. Now they've gone from winning. To losing, yeah, uh, and they and they blame it all on the coach, and you know I don't even I'm even blanking on the name of the coach, but they're 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 totally nuts about it. And my my friend uh, Massimo Lopez Pena, who is the 
It's a New York-based correspondent for Gazzetta della Sport. He's been living in the Greenwich Village forever, and he and I are sitting there, and we realize we're going to have to sit. These, these German guys are not going to go back to work. They're going to go out onto Houston Street and throw themselves under the, the Crosstown bus. <laughs> these guys, these hey, George. Guys are gonna kill them. These guys are going to kill themselves en masse. It's going to be like a mass suicide of German, you know, 20-something, 30-something German football fans. And we're, like, talking them down off, off, off uh, you know, German hurry curry. They're saying, don't kill yourself. It's not worth it. Don't do it. It's only a game. And he's going, well, maybe you're right. But, I mean, it was it was a disaster. But that was the kind of thing that would happen in there. And, and by the way, there was no jeering. I mean, the English fans didn't, didn't goof on the German fans. It was all, you know, all very grown up. But these guys just took it. So, and that was the kind of thing that happens in New York because we're such an international city. And, and hey, George, I got to interrupt. I got to interrupt. Go, go for it. Because as uh, Fela Kuta is playing, and we had to go to break. You're listening to the SDL United Soccer Show, KFNS, 590 The Fan, KFNS.com. Hey, you're back with me, Tom Schwarz, my guy, Vin Co. And I want to remind you that this segment is brought to you by your friends at the Olive Garden, seven metro locations. Remember, when you're at the Olive Garden, you're family. Okay, our guest is George Vesey, who, in addition to all the other writing has done, last year wrote the book on St. Louis icon Stan Musial. And now the paperback is coming out, right? Well, the paperback is coming out in May. May. Um, we've updated it just slightly for a couple of things that that, that happened in the last year and a couple of little uh, errata that, that we, we discovered. But basically it's the same. However, I would say to all my friends in St. Louis, first of all, I would say thank you for making it a bestseller and for, uh, you know, for, for doing very well with the book. But I would also say that the, for, for anybody who doesn't have it, that the hardcover is just so much more desirable, and there are still a few copies out, out in the world. So if, if you're a St. Louis household without the hard cover, but anyway, that's enough of my, my blatant and, and repulsive pitch. Well, it's it's not enough for me. <laughs> because, you, you know what? Hey, George, this is the St. Louis United Soccer Show. And what this isn't just about soccer. This is about St. Louis. And for me reading that book, it took me back to being a kid. And, and just all the stuff that I could, you know, like what a huge fan of Stan Musial my mom was. And, you know, what a big deal that was when I was a kid. And you just have recreated that, not re- captured it, I guess is the correct term. Uh, that you well, I, kept- I appreciate that. I mean, I, I got the feeling, of, I've known it since I first went to St. Louis with the Mets in 62, you know, now 50 years ago since the, uh, the Mets went out there on their second trip. But I've known Musial and seen him at his restaurant and, and, and known him a little bit that way. But to see all these lovely people, I was on, I, I can mention this, I was on the Charlie Brennan um, book show that he does from downtown, mm-hmm. and seeing these really nice people, my generation, and most of them ladies with their red jerseys on and standing in line and thanking me for writing the book. And I'm thinking, well, you know, ma'am, I got paid for it. And, <laughs> quite nicely and, and, and you were, But they were so nice to buy the book, and, and it meant so much to them. And I, I can't think think of many athletes then or now who touch an entire community the way Musial did. He was just the right person for St. Louis. Uh, but your your book was great. Hey, what, and vice versa. What did you take uh what did you take away from St. Louis as a result of this experience? I mean, God, you've been coming here for years. Yeah. Um, what did I take away from it? I mean, first of all, the sense of, of community. I went back to his old neighborhood, my friend Mickey McTagg, who passed, um, you know, r- r- really in, over the winter. Yeah. I went out and had a uh, meal with him in the neighborhood where Musial had lived. And I'm blanking, it's, I want to say South St. Louis, right? Um, where, where Musial had lived, where the first uh, Stan and Biggies was. And so I went, and, and he wasn't well, and we went out to some local place. But to um, to go into a na- neighborhoods like that and see that those neighborhoods are still there within 10 or 15 minutes of downtown, and it is still very much... My, I was talking with somebody the other day, a, a friend of mine who, who lives out there. She's transplanted to, to, to live out there and work there. And she was talking about how 
being an outsider there, that the first question that people ask you when they meet you is, what high school did oh, you Oh, absolutely. Go to? A and, friend and of mine had, wrote I a book. Of, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I had some of that in the book um, in, in talking to the, uh, a former football opponent of Dick Musial, who had played for St. Louis U High School, I guess it is, and played against Christian Brothers, right. and what that rivalry was like. That's like back a Darby. In the day. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. And we have, we have two derbies going on in the FA Cup this weekend. Yeah, and and St. Louis has its own derby oh. of these two, you know, really fine Catholic schools when they would play each other in football. And I'm and I'm sure anything else that um, you know, there, there was there was nothing quite like it. But it it makes people very proud of their roots, and and it is a home community. I mean, St. Louis, and you know, even with the static. Uh, population has moved out into the suburbs, and and people stay a long time. Yeah. Anybody you want to say hey to? Huh. Well, I got my friends Abby and Peter out in the suburbs, and I'm gonna I'm gonna miss their daughter's bat mitzvah, uh, which which I regret. I just can't get out there, but I certainly would shout out to them and and so many you know so many other people. Lynn McGuire, uh, you know John John's sure. uh, w- wife, and and you know just so many people who've been nice to me, and all my friends who were nice. I mean. Uh, McGraw Milhaven and Charlie Brennan and all those great people that I that I met on the book tour and, and my lovely driver the, the the lady who took me around I'm blanking on on her name but anyway it, it, I made a lot of friends in St Louis you sure and, did and of course who who can forget can I can I say who can forget our our proprietor of of my lady um, my, my mouth waters when I say the word Quitron yeah the, the, their ad will be running running shortly um, hey. Oh. Uh, two things real quick we got a couple minutes left first of all wh- what's the weather like I, I saw the report on fires uh out in your neck of the woods yeah there were, it was further out uh, okay. in kind of an o- o- open flatlands um on long island which is which is um you know a, lo- a lot flat and and it's just but not now here we do have a drought and on the other hand i see warnings of tornadoes coming in from uh from the west into oh, brother. The, the sort, of, sort of the middle west for the weekend. So yeah. anyway, I don't know if it's going to uh, hitting into Missouri, but uh, be be careful. Keep yeah. you keep your head down. Look I, for the funnel clouds. I got we, 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 we did actually. We had a twister go through um, Queens uh, right near my house about two years ago, and it blew down a lot of trees near the U.S. Open, uh, the National Tennis Center, and all of that. It was weird. You can still see the trees knocked down in certain parks. I mean, it was it was legitimately a, a twister wind that that knocked these things down. So we 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 did get one. Yeah, they're they're the real deal. Hey, I read yeah, well, you, uh, get, you get them bad out that way. I saw what it did to St. Louis when I was out there for the World Series. Last yeah. Year. Um, to switch gears real quick, we got about a minute left. I want you to tell people about your blog that people can read you on a regular basis. Where? Oh, aren't you nice? I do have. I have my own website. Um, don't love the word blog for some reason. It just sounds like uh, yeah, it does. Like, but I mean, like, it's like just... what you do when you when you've drink, been drinking too much beer at one of those nice <laughs> places. And but but anyway, I have a website called georgebessie.com dot com. And about every other day, I write something. I write a lot of soccer things and a lot of baseball things. But I also have observations. I've got something up today about um, listening to your grandparents talk because they may be gone. My my grandmother knew all about the Titanic and. Uh, you know, I'd come over here on the same line. So anyway, that's what I'm writing about. Talk, ask questions of your grandparents while they're around. It was, it, it's a great, as per usual, a great piece. Hey, George, there's music. We got to go. Thanks. I, I appreciate it. It's always nice talking to you, man. I'll see you soon. All right. Yeah. Cheers, mate. Take care. Okay, we need to go to break. You're listening to the STL United Soccer Show, KFNS 590 The Fan, com. Back to the STL United Soccer Show on 590 The Fan, KFNS, and KFNS.com. Hey, you're back on the show with me, Tom Schwarz, and i got to tell you about our pal Dan Davis at 80K Wealth Group because Dan is looking for quality and experienced financial advisors. Here are some of 80K's competitive advantages. One, advisors own their own practice, so they have equity and autonomy. Two, they have higher payouts. Three, They are part of a successful branch office focusing on providing financial planning and independent investment management strategies. If you think you qualify, give Dan a call, 314-878-1734. 
878-1734, www.discoverindependence.com. Tell them you heard about him on the soccer show. And it's time for the O.B. Clark's Game of the Week. And I do have to say, before we talk about soccer, i got to tell you that the place to watch the Blues march to the Stanley Cup. March to the Stanley Cup is O.B. Clark's. The best viewing angles and the waitresses ain't bad either. You never know who you're going to see at O.B. Clark's. Ask for the SDL United Dirty Wings. Now, Vin Coe replacing the ACT taking Mike Mickler. I don't even know that I can compete with Mike Mickler, but um, I'll try. The, um, this week, we have two huge games in the Champions League in Europe. We got Real Madrid versus Bar- er, ba- <laughs> Bayern Munich um, in this second leg of that f- semifinal, right? Yeah. And um, so we have two. First leg. No, first leg. First leg, yeah. First leg. Boy, um, you can't, you know, <laughs> Michael. Say, can we text him during the during the <laughs> test? That won't be an, an issue, would it? I, I think he should just phone in for the. That's I right. mean, they should have enough time. But yeah. um, two huge players for Real Madrid: Cristiano Ronaldo, of course. He has the monstrous goal scoring record for Madrid. But in Europe, in I mean, even in international play, he just hasn't really shown up on the stage against in those really big games that matter and. Uh, he really needs to be at his best because um, Bayern Munich has just got a tremendous defense. And Terry, you've been fo- do you fo- have you followed Bayern this year? I have sure. not at all. Yeah, off and on. How are they doing? Well, doing well. Um, you know, when they have their full complement of players, uh, when Robin, Iron Robin's playing well, and their young young players uh, are in the game, they're they're a team to be reckoned with for sure. Yeah, Robin yeah. is a wonderful player. He's okay, a difference maker. Quick, get to the other game because I want to talk about what's happened in the Premier League, what happened today and what, what okay, happens yeah. tomorrow. The second <clears throat> second big game in the semifinal is uh, the Chelsea versus Barcelona, Terry's favorite Barca. Um, of course, the key player there would be Messi. He, he's just unreal, you know. There's a little Barca. history between those two teams, too, in their <laughs> yeah. In yeah. recent years. Yeah. Definitely. And for Chelsea, it's important that they have that stonewall defense that's been a bit shaky in recent months so we'll see how they can stand the they test seem to of... be playing better though better but still not at the top of their game yeah. you know jack They're... terry's playing with a little injury yeah carrying a cracked rib and that's that's tough tough to do when you're playing on the field and you need your you need everything going for you cracked rib really really limits you I, I hate to say this but i i find myself actually rooting for chelsea sometimes now <laughs> because i really like their coach i like Di, Ma- Di, Mateo, Di Mateo, right yeah. but you know even if he wins Champions League, they'll fire him. <laughs> it seems to be the nature of the yeah. beast at Chelsea. Yeah, it's just a revolving door over there. Okay, okay. So have we covered the Champions League. Are we yes, finished? Sir. Yeah. We're, all right. Okay. <laughs> Today, Man City six one. Last oh. week, United loses. Right. I mean, who did they lose? To? Wigan. 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 Yeah. Okay. Today, Man City comes back with Carlos Tevez replacing Mario <laughs> Balotelli. Oh boy, there's a switch. <laughs> and they six one. They looked. Unbelievable against whoever they were playing. Yeah. Now the pressure is squarely on United. Whereas a week ago we were talking about it being over. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say the pressure squarely on United because I think Sir Alex has has this stretch run pretty calculated. Uh, and I think every once in a while, at the end of the year, year like that, it's not bad to take a loss because it gets you right back on balance. You know, um, and the loss is early enough out that, that it can recover from it. And get back onto their bearings. Uh, now for Man City, the six-one win was really impressive. Getting Tevez back in the lineup brings brings a, a talent that's hungry and fresh. You know, put all all the uh, grief behind and go forward. That gives them a chance. You know, I I thought last week they were kind of out of it. I listened to an interview from uh, Mancini. Yeah, and he, he pretty almost much conceded in second place. Yeah, you know? yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. So they got a life, but they still got to get through. Well, the great you and and Sir Alex. Yeah, the 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 great thing is that it looked like. I'm, I'm certainly more of a United fan than a City fan, except that I want to see the game on the 30th have meaning. I think everybody does. You know, yeah, that's the classic right there. Yeah. Build it up to that game, and then the winner take all. Yeah, that, and, and to make up from the six-one uh, thumping. Hey, um, you know we need to start talking about the European Championships because we haven't talked about them at all. I keep thinking, oh, we're going to get to it, and they're going to be here before you know it. Who's the fa- obviously Spain's the favorite going in, right? I think Spain and Germany right now seem to be the, the two most talked about teams. Yeah. Germany with those youth players that are coming through, it's just an amazing squad that they have 
What a turnover they've had yeah. in their whole uh, approach, their build up, their mentality, their their team makeup. Yeah, They're totally different. And now, who's who are the the start was is Mario Gomez? Is he German? Or and he's a is he a star for? Uh, he's not German by 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 birth, but maybe by nationality. The way they all that matters is if he's, yeah. if he's does he wear the shirt, right? Yeah, right. right yeah. Exactly. He could well be. Yeah, I mean, it's, Germany is just a well-rounded team. Um, I think the Netherlands also has a good shot. I mean, the yeah, they always do. <laughs> you know, they always do. It's just whether they actually show up and get it done. I mean, they had the best chance in the 2010 final, and then they get oh, to yeah. the last game and decide they don't want to play Dutch soccer. And shame on them. So we'll see. Well, someday. <laughs> someday. All right, any other big games coming up that we're aware of? Oh, Classico. El Classico is, is on Saturday, I believe. Next yes. Next Saturday, yes. Next Saturday. At, um, I believe, 1 p.m.? Uh, it's, you know, with Goal TV, you do not know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been checking Goal TV right. for years, and it's it. you won't know until about Wednesday exactly what time. And also the Spanish right. uh, La Liga, yeah. they play games. If it's in Barcelona, they might not kick off till. 10 to 12 yeah. midnight you know just uh, because that's of course where we will be watching those games then the center of the universe ob clark south this, off brentwood over there by uh on Ford. brentwood on brentwood on brentwood just south of highway 40 and what would you ask for if you went in there the stl united dirty wings of course oh and, my what, gosh. and what if they said to you Vin? <laughs> what if judy the waitress my favorite waitress in the whole world said to you vin that's not on the menu <laughs> I would have to, I would have to ask the manager. I, Demand your dirty wings. <laughs> hey, there's the music. We're actually going to go to break on time this time. Uh, you're listening to the STL United Soccer Show, KFNS five ninety The Fan, KFNS dot com. Back on the show with Tom Schwarz, Vin Coe, Terry Mickler. And it's time for the Dutch Touch Coaches Corner presented by Sam's Steakhouse. You know, Sam's has been open for nearly 20 years. The entire facility has been upgraded and modernized without destroying its original old world charm. Their primary goal is to provide each guest culinary excellence and superb service. Sam's is aware that you have many dining choices and they truly appreciate that you've chosen Sam's. 10,000 205 Gravoy Road, two blocks east of Grant's Farm, 314-849-3033, 849-3033. Terry. Yes, sir, Tom. Tonight, today I want to review an article came out this week uh, over the uh, Internet about the Olympic uh, loss. And uh, they caught up with John O'Brien. Some of the soccer listeners might remember John O'Brien of the U.S. national team uh, fame. But more more importantly, John O'Brien left the U.S. He was a Southern California player, went to uh, Amsterdam and uh, joined Ajax at age 17 and uh, had a career in Holland with Ajax and a couple of other teams and grew up in, in his professional system playing a 4-3-3. And the article talks about one of the failures of the U.S. Olympic team to qualify was the fact that the, the the coaching staff changed the formation, the playing formation, to a four three three, which may or may not seem like much of a, of, of an issue, but the the changing of the formation also changes a whole lot more than just putting people in different spots. It's the interaction of the people in those spots, how they play their spot, and how they play with the with the surrounding people around them. And you know they were leading going into the last minutes of the game, only to give up a late counterattack goal which then allowed for an astute observer like John O'Brien to say, hey, maybe the reason that they gave up that goal was because they weren't comfortable playing the system. So here's a few quotes that he, that he has uh, regarding that game. He said, um, while the Americans were potent and incisive going forward in the attack, they were naive and vulnerable when they lost possession. And it said, U.S. players weren't prepared for the unique demands of the system they were playing in, it requires players to think defensively even when they have the ball. 
Wow, how about that? <laughs> now, most people can't relate to that, okay? But uh, I'm going to say that I can a little bit because I've done some study on IX playing concepts, and, and big a big part of their playing concept is anticipation. And it's anticipation on both sides of the ball. It's anticipating when your team has the ball, what the options might be, and how you might be part of all that. But it's also anticipating the loss of possession and not to be spread out and stretched and leaving gapping spaces if you lose the ball. And so, you know, this is a critical comment for him to make. And, and, and it says that, that has to be ingrained a little bit more what to do in transition. You're on offense, but you're still thinking defensively. So, you know, part of our, our game is we, we talk a lot about systems. But in the U.S., I think the prominent system is four four two. I know in coaching at CBC High School, I haven't played four four two in 20, 25 years. Okay, so I play usually play th- – I always play three in the back, and I either play a three five two in some variation or a three four three. So I have to get my players readjusted and reoriented to play in the way I want. Depending on the players I have, you know, Every system is dependent on the players. And if the players fit the system, then it's the right system. How many coaches do you think recognize what you just said? I don't know, but it's out there for them. They can take it, take well, it as I mean, much as how, they can. Don't you think most coaches take the kids and try to no, I think most fit coaches, them into the system? I think most coaches have? learn the system and just take the kids and put them in wherever right. they think it, think it works best. You know, right. But, you know, as John O'Brien says later on in his article, he says we probably didn't have – the right players to play the system because they weren't trained in the playing that system, you know. And, and I know it's, from year to year, I'll try to do different things with my guys, and I'll, I'll realize right away whether or not they're they're going to be okay with it or not. And if they're not, then we get out of it real quickly, you know. But when you grow up in a system, and in, 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 in throughout Holland, every youth team plays a four three three, so it's they learn it early on, and it, and it, it's ingrained in them. In the U.S., if you grow up playing in a four-four-two, and then all of a sudden in a crucial game, the Olympic qualifier game like that, you switch to a four-three-three. Even though it sounds like it's a good way to play, because Ajax plays that way, and Barcelona plays that way, and a lot of the Europeans play that way. If it's not right for your players, it's not the right system to play. So you know, and there has to, always has to be a balance between what you do with the ball in attack and what you do when you lose the ball in defense. And that critical moment, that critical moment, is always that transition phase. You know, how quickly do you recognize, respond, react to, to losing the ball and work to win it back? And how quickly do you respond when you win the ball and, and, and create an attack to the goal? And, and th- you know, that's, that has to be trained, and it can be trained in small-sided games. There's lots of ways to train that. So it's not something that's beyond our, our scope. We could definitely do it. We just have to be more in sync with the need to do it. So I find that article to be extremely interesting. And when you play a, a 4-3-3, you're playing three midfielders, and three lends itself to the shape of a triangle, and there's two options to play that triangle. You can play the point up as, as an attacking player or the point back as a defensive player. The Dutch play the point up, and they call that a shadow striker. So they have their number nine player, the deep striker, and then they have their number 10 player playing behind them to kind of feed, it, feed that player. Uh, Barcelona plays with the play, with the point backwards and they call that the pivot that's the defending player that organizes holds holds the whole shape of the team together wins the ball through anticipation and starts to play so but they do that because that's the way their system works best you know so i I think in summary for the u.s just to say you know we're going to go to a 4-3-3 with all these players that aren't used to it i think lent itself to a little bit of of uh part of the problem of the breakdown and the loss of the game you know so i think we got to reevaluate that it's a good system but do we have the players that are trained to play it if if so good if not that we got to if we like the system we got to train the players to play it do you think that. do you think we have the play do you think we have the players oh you know, sure sure it's, but it's but it's a matter of training them you know uh, players are very adaptable you know and and it's also about finding the players that can play that system the best so if, if that's the system they want to play then maybe they need to look at a different group of players that might better suit that system because the key to the 4-3-3 is that it's it, it complete field occupation a lot of individual activity but you're still playing in, in groups and that's that's the issue you got to be able to play individually with a high skill level but you got to be able to combine and that takes a lot of training a lot of training to blend those two together Okay, there's the music. We need to go to break. You've been listening to the Dutch Touch Coaches Corner presented by Sam Steakhouse and the STL United Soccer Show, KFNS 590 The Fan, KFNS.com. Now, 
back to the STL United Soccer Show on 590 The Fan KFNS and KFNS.com. Okay, you're back on the show with me, Tom Schwartz, and I want to tell you, Segment 6 is brought to you by Johnny Mac Sporting Goods Company, a family-owned and operated institution since 1967. Johnny Mac supplies anything you need for soccer. With a passion for home team sports, Johnny Max has built its reputation on providing expert knowledge and old-school customer service within a family-friendly environment. There are eight stores across Missouri, Illinois, and Michigan. There are five stores in Metro St. Louis. Visit johnnymax.com for store hours, maps, and more. Tell them you heard about it here. Okay, we're joined by Terry Mickler, Vin Co. Yeah, um, Tom, I just wanted to give a big shout-out to Arno over there. Um, Arno. And his beloved the Liverpool. Scousers, <laughs> the been, Scousers pulled it out today, didn't they? With a backwards header from Andy Carroll, 2-1 over Everton. And Unbelievable. That, and that, you know, Arno does our wet, his, man, he's just a great guy. And he is a diehard Liverpool fan. I and it's got to be there. hard, hard, hard to be a Liverpool oh, fan. Yeah. Although now they got a chance for two cups. Okay, that was your St. Louis Lions Scoreboard. Liverpool won. Arno is in heaven. Okay. We're joined by one of my favorite people on the planet, Meg Huber. Meg is with the Immaculata Parish St. Vincent de Paul Society. Hey, Meg, before we talk about the trivia night, what does St. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul Society do? Well, St. Vincent de Paul Society is the largest lay Catholic volunteer organization in the United States. And it is... Um, Autonomous in that any money we raise goes directly to the poor. We serve people in thousands of ways, primarily with utility, food, clothing, housing assistance. Um, there's a, a program for criminal justice. There's um, a program for uh, families if their home has been burned. We have thrift stores. We have food pantries. It's It was... Actually, the United States um, St. Vincent de Paul Society is headquartered in St. Louis and oh, was really? started here. Really? The very first St. Vincent de Paul Society by was who? at the old cathedral. Really? Mm-hmm. Um, by the French. Huh. <laughs> the French began St. Vincent de Paul. Oh, wow. St. Vincent so de Paul was from France. So it's this is a, this has been around for a while. Oh, yeah, since the mid-1800s. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So um, – <clears throat> It's it's a wonderful organization. The thing I love the most about it is if you give me ten dollars, right? I know I can buy bread. Uh, and I will I will per- personally vouch for this because my my basketball group has teamed up with with Meg over the past few years. And man, there's nothing like like seeing it's you light so up great. because <laughs> they've really supported us. They've carried us at times when we really we didn't have a clue how we were going to. We twin twinning means that we. Um, we reach out to other conferences. We're each called conferences in the community that have have no means for funding. They have very little means, but they have lots of manpower. So we we work to raise funds so that they can reach out to the people that need them. Yeah. We we answer calls where we are, and those come in on a regular basis. Some people just knock on the rectory door, and we get a call to come and meet with them. Sometimes it's, uh, for instance, a prisoner who might have been released and has no no place to go. We kind of work with them as much as we can. We have mostly it's um, food or um, rental assistance. Rental assistance is hard because it's so expensive. Yeah. Well, the, the point you made earlier and the point that really hit home with me these now many years ago was that I give you ten bucks. You give it to somebody who needs it. There's no administrative cost. Right. You look at some of these charities, and hardly any money gets to the people. Right. And I've met the I've met the at least in my parish, in Macalotta, uh, the people involved with St. Vincent de Paul. And the reason we got involved was because of Dr. Bob, Bob Loin, yeah. who is just one of the greatest men I've ever really, met. Really, he is. Yeah. So, when did you get involved personally? Um, about two thousand. Uh, before that, I was doing other things, but you know, I kind of felt a commitment and a need then. 
Well, okay. The reason you're here today is because of the Immaculata. Because we're raising money again. Uh, no, shocking. <laughs> Spend my life looking uh, for money. Well, hey, begging. There are there are worse ways to live one's life than the way <laughs> I you don't live. Know. Well, okay, St. Vincent yeah. de Paul uh, Trivia Night. It's a game of another sort. A game of another sort. <laughs> it's a trivia night, and all of the money will go to St. Vincent de Paul at Immaculata. So um, we need to raise approximately three to $4,000 a month in order to meet the needs, the commitments that we make. Yeah. So it's a big deal, I mean, yeah. you know, trying to raise that much money. But we have great people. They're, they're generous, and they come out for this. It's a fun night. Can too. I ask you a question? Mm-hmm. Who won that competition last year? Oh, I don't know. I don't know who it was. <laughs> the team. The team. No, do you I really need don't me know who that. I don't know who it was. The, the, you don't remember that after coming in three years in a row in second place that the Immaculata <laughs> Monday Night Basketball team won? I know. And that we were criticized for cheating because there were two soccer rounds written by Bill McDermott. <laughs> there was only, the only one, wasn't that, there? Wasn't there only one okay, soccer round? One. It was hard. My gosh. We deserve yeah, you have a anything. PhD in soccer. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we have Bill McDermott. That's better than a PhD. Well, I know, but he was writing the questions. So I was like, help. Oh. <laughs> oh, you see how that works, huh, Terry? I wonder if he knew the answers, huh? Well, I, I asked him to do a soccer category, but I was like blown away. Would you argue with Bill over a soccer fact? Or anything? Oh, uh, God. Or anything Why would you for do that, that matter? Why would you do that? Okay, all right. We only we don't have a lot of time. Can left. I tell you the time? Yes, please. The time is the doors open at six o'clock. Tables of eight. It's twenty dollars a person. For thirty dollars extra, the whole table gets pizzas and salad. There's refreshments. Um, St. Louis finest Anheuser Busch products. All of that. It comes with your ticket. Lots and lots of prizes. Six o'clock. Eighty nine hundred Clayton Road. Eighty nine hundred. All the money goes to St. Vincent de Paul. Right. And, and, you know, if you're saying, oh, a Macalotta, why would I? You know, it's not just a Macalotta. I'm telling you what. You know, Meg, somebody needs some help. She's the person. And the look that, uh, true story, Sally, the, a gal that works with Sally, my wife, had her place broken into. And they took everything, including the kids' clothes. Mm. Now, how low can you get that you still, well, that's another topic. Anyway, I call Meg. Hey, Meg, do you think you can help? Boom. Next. I mean, not that day. No, that day you were in. I was in Washington with my son. Yeah. Right, 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 Grandma. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, as soon as she got back here, Tom, here's some stuff. And, and Jennifer uh, was crying about it, you know, because when you're, when you're hurting, you yeah. just need help. Right. Once again, this is next Friday, which right. is the reason you're here, because most people who listen right. to the show have no memory whatsoever. Adam Macalotta. Unless it's a soccer score, right? Unless it's a soccer score. Okay. You, and thank you for everything you've done for us. Oh, thank you. Hey, a special shout out to our guy, Blake Ahern. He's playing for the Utah Jazz. Come on, folks. Wow. Nice. All right, there's the music. You've been listening to the STL United Soccer Show, KFNS, 590 The Fan, KFNS.com. Bye bye. <laughs>